Hello, everyone. It's Thursday, September 15th. Welcome to the final bar. Today, we're going to talk about that S&P 3900 level, not just a level to think about at some point. It's a level that is in play today. We'll also be talking with John Kosar from Asbury Research about his take on the markets and the Asbury 6 model. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Everyone, welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts. Our toolkit is designed to help us understand the message of price, focus on what the markets are telling us back in the form of price and breadth indicators, sentiment indicators, all to try to understand this market environment. I mentioned that S&P 3900 level. We were recording our latest episode of The Pitch earlier today. We talked a lot about that S&P 3900 level, why that was so important, and just really how to think about the probability of further downside and how to manage that risk in your portfolio. We have a lot of great charts to look out here and, uh, and a great guest coming up, uh, John Kosar from Asbury Research. Just to let you know the upcoming schedule, we're working on some guests for next week, but I did want to highlight the week after we actually have three solid guests. Uh, Mark Chaikin of Chaikin Analytics is going to be joining us on Tuesday, the 27th. He created many of the technical indicators you may use. We'll talk with him about how he's perceiving this current market. Miss Schneider from Market Gage is going to join us uh, the day after that. And then Greg Schnell uh, from uh, Osprey Strategic is going to be joining us on Thursday, September 29th. Let's continue on. Uh, oh, actually, I also wanted to let you know about a small event we have coming up in uh, early October ChartCon. If you go to stockcharts.com slash ChartCon, this is our annual, potentially an annual event. We'll see how this one goes, but we're really excited to put this one together. We are bringing in a lot of fantastic speakers to our new studios in Redmond, Washington to present technical analysis and how to apply it to this current market environment. I did want to highlight one of the sessions we will be doing, which is an interactive market outlook panel. I have three expert Panelists, along with myself, we are going to be asking all of you as attendees the week before the event where you see certain markets heading over the next couple of months between now and year end. We will review those results as a group, talk about our own takes on the markets, and help you sort of think about some different alternative hypotheses about where the markets may be headed. It should be a lot of fun. That's just one of the many events we have going on. Go to stockcharts.com slash chartcon to sign up for that event. Let's continue on today's show with our market recap. As I mentioned, S&P 3900, a pretty important level. Many of us commentators on stock charts have been mentioning on our shows and in our articles the importance of that level. Let's look at what's happened today as the S&P literally closed right around there. The S&P just around uh, just above 3900. Uh, down about 1.1%. Now, this is after yesterday's kind of choppy digestion day and after Tuesday's significant drawdown. This is sort of a potentially a reinitiation of the downside. Again, it all it all depends on how we trade around that level of support. And, uh, and I think we've reached it. The question going into tomorrow, which is an option expiration day, uh, what does the market do next? NASDAQ down even more, about 1.4%. The VIX pushing back to the upside. We talked a lot about that uh, volatility range. VIX in uh, 2022 has ranged from around 20 on the lower end, around 30, 35 on the upper end. We're kind of right in the middle of that range. We'll look at the VIX uh, in a little bit uh, as part of our getting sentimental segment as we look at other survey data and uh, other sentiment indicators. Elsewhere, we have interest rates pushing on to the upside. So when you have interest rates moving higher, it tends to be a headwind for uh, the growth areas of the market, particularly technology and consumer, although you see some of those actually uh, in the upper end of the, of the list of sectors today. We'll get to the sector returns here in a few moments, but I do want to mention the dollar index, not too much change. Same with bond prices, essentially similar to where we at yesterday on the uh, TLT. Commodities broadly moving lower with gold and silver both down around 2%. That's using the, uh, the common uh, commodity ETFs we have listed on our uh, dashboard page. Also, all red, when you looked at the crypto, uh, look at the cryptocurrency space, Bitcoin pushing back below 20,000, 
uh, earlier today, uh, currently around 19,830. That's down about 2% from yesterday. Ether really getting hit uh, down around uh, 1,500. That's down 8% from yesterday. So both of those, Bitcoin and Ethereum, the two sort of most commonly looked at uh, cryptocurrencies, both had been showing signs of life, but both really deteriorating in the last uh, in the last week or two. Now starting to test some of those levels of support, it felt like we're far back in the rear view mirror. Now, once again, uh, becoming kind of relevant. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500, see how today's move fits into the big picture. As of today, we close right around 3,900. And that's that big blue line we have here on our chart. If you take the June low to the July high, 61.8% of the way, it gets you right around 3,900. That's pretty much where we're at. This is the level we bounced off of about a week and a half ago in uh, early September. Uh, and that's the level we've been uh, we've been focusing on. What concerns me when there's a level that a lot of people are focused on, two things tend to happen. Number one, you often get a bounce off of there. And that's why that bounce in early September made a ton of sense. So many people focusing in on that level of support. It would be more surprising if it didn't play out as a level of support, right? As opposed to being surprised that the price bounced, right? So many people looking at it. The other side to that coin, unfortunately, is if and when we would break that level, if so many people are expecting support, that support no longer is there, then what, right? If we move more risk off, then it becomes sort of a feedback loop of pessimism as more downside that feeds further selling, which leads to further downside. That's how real strong downtrends can sort of uh, play out. So at this point, again, I think it's all about what happens through the remainder of this week, really going into next week. This is, of course, setting us up for options expiration tomorrow on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week, we have the Fed meeting. There are a lot of potential catalysts. And all I would remind you is uh, I was talking to someone earlier today um, about uh, headlines. Remember that uh, we will often attribute a move in the market to a particular headline. In financial media, they're famous for doing this, right? The market moves higher because of uh, um, optimism about earnings. The market moves lower because of renewed inflation fears. What you have to remember is that second half of the headline is often completely made up, right? It's trying to draw on some theme because you don't want to just say that the market just moved because it just moved. But I will tell you, talking to people like Jay Woods on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange many times, sometimes the markets just move and there's no particular reason or it's a collection of reasons, right? It's a bunch of different factors that net out to a particular reason. A lot of times there's one big catalyst, but then there's a lot of other things because investors are motivated on different timeframes for different investment goals. This is why charts are so valuable, because it doesn't worry about the why. It just focuses on the what. And as Ralph Akinpour would often remind me, price is fact. When price moves, uh, something, is, uh, something is important they need to follow. Let's finish off our market recap just looking at the 11 S&P sectors. The top two today, the only two in the green at the end of the day, healthcare up about 0.6%, uh, financials up 0.3%. Everything else was down on the day, led by some real movements to the downside from energy, down about 2.6%. Utilities down 2.5%. Uh, technology, real estate, both down over 2%. It's interesting, utilities and energy, two of the better performing sectors on a relative basis uh, recently, right? Uh, energy stocks, a lot of them have been rotating higher. We highlighted uh, in recent shows things like, oh, let's see, EOG, Hess, we've, uh, Apache. We've talked about a lot of those that have just been in these nice orderly uh, uptrends. Utilities as well, one of the better relative sectors out of all of them recently. And those two, I think still at this point, the only two of the 11 S&P sectors above their 200-day moving averages. So those actually giving back some of those recent gains. And it's some other sectors a lot, I think, to be honest, have forgotten about. I haven't heard people talking about financials a lot. And I certainly haven't heard people talking about healthcare because, to be honest, the results have been mixed. However, some interesting, uh, interesting uh, note when the market is down to see what sectors are actually doing well. And for the record, it's those two, uh, healthcare and financials. Just to finish off here, I'm going to glance quickly at our Mindful Investor Live chart list because I did want to hit on a measure of breadth or two if we could, because we haven't talked about uh, some of these in a, in a little while. This is our uh, cumulative advanced decline chart. So this is looking at four different universes of stocks. We have the uh, New York Stock Exchange, only common stocks there at the top. And then we have the S&P 500 large caps, the S&P mid cap, the S&P small cap, basically looking at daily advancers, decliners, but then taking a cumulative uh, total of that uh, of that daily uh, data point 
to come up with these uh, these trends. And overall, the general thesis, the general idea is to look at the trend in the advanced decline lines versus the trend in the overall price. Are they agreeing with what you're seeing there? What's interesting right now is for all four of these, they're right around the 50-day moving average. All four of them getting right above the 50-day in July, I thought was an interesting uh, point. When all four of them got above their June highs in mid uh, early mid-August, that was pretty encouraging as well. All four of those now have given back a lot of those gains and now right back to the 50-day moving averages. We're thinking about uh, you know, going through uh, the end of this week into next week. I'd be very interested to see if these are able to hold or, or get back above their 50-day moving averages. If not, and if you see these things breaking down, you have to question the upside potential for the broader market. Speaking of the 50-day moving average, last chart we have time for is this one. Looking at the percent of S&P members above their 200-day moving average, which is down to around 30% just below there, right? So three out of 10 S&P names above their 200-day. That means seven out of 10 still below the 200-day. Also, look at the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average. It's back down to the 30s. Now, when the market spiked higher uh, uh, end of last week into Monday, you saw this indicator get above 70%, which means how many, look at all, how many stocks had actually whipped right back above their 50-day, just like the S&P 500 did. But as the S&P came right back down, gapped below its 50-day moving average, now testing support. About 40 plus percent of the S&P did that exact same thing. The fact that you have so many stocks failing to hold their 50-day is a bit of a concerning uh, data point for me. That remains below 50% as an indicator. I'd have to question sort of the overall strength of this market. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with John Kosar from Asbury Research. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close. A couple quick announcements before we get to today's guest. John Kosar, first off, we welcome your feedback on our show, on your host, on our content, on all the shows on Stock Charts TV, but particularly your questions. We are here to help you navigate the technical analysis world, navigate the lessons of market history, and focus on the Stock Charts platform. Our email is the final bar at StockCharts.com. We're on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV, and we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours in our next mailbag segment on Friday show of this week. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That's our on-demand platform. We have people like John Kosar, really knowledgeable experts coming through Stock Charts TV every trading day. All of their guest insights and expertise are available for free at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, John Kosar. John's been a frequent guest on the show. He's the founder of Asbury Research, coming to us from Chicago. John, it's great to see you and welcome back. Thanks. It's great to be here. Interesting day. An interesting day among many. This week has been a challenging week, I think, for a lot of investors. You've had the, you know, the big rally into the beginning of the week, the gap lower on Tuesday, down 5%. Take care of all of that for us. How are you making sense of this market uh, today? Well, looking at it from tactical, which for us is 21 business days, our tactical, our Asbury 6, which I know we're going to look at in a, a little bit, that turned back to red or negative uh, right around August 23rd. And it's still negative right now. But looking at the S&P 500 chart here, you can see there's a lot of traffic in between 39 and 4,200 really since uh, going all the way back to May. So that indicates a decision. There's some churn there. People aren't sure if we're going to have a soft landing or if this is going to extend. I mean, I listen to you know financial shows every day, financial TV every day, because that's the chatter that I used to hear when I was on the trading floor. You hear the buzz and you hear what everyone's talking about. And it gives me kind of a sense of what the market thinks. And you can see all of this indecision here um, indicating there's a lot of hand wringing here. I think people realize that this is a big inflection point for the market. 
Um, so we've obviously have a lot of a lot of chop. I, I love that you brought your Asbury six with you because we've talked about this on previous shows. You mentioned it had turned back to the bear side. Talk us through what this is telling you about the current environment. It's I always look at this. I built this five, six years ago because looking at the S&P 500 and volume for a back of the envelope indication of what the market was doing wasn't working anymore. The market's up 100 today. It's down 50 tomorrow. It's very difficult to look at the market and make a rational decision. So I tested six indicators that would look at the market, not just staring at the S&P 500. There is the rate of change in the S&P here, here up top, but the other five are secondary indicators that really can't be influenced very much, if at all, by one of those wild days. We were up 100 or down 100 in the S&P 500. We're looking at high yield corporate bond spreads, um, trading volume, market breadth, asset flows. So right now, this is telling me the patient is sick. Um, on a very short-term basis, there's a lot of red there. Four or more red indicates a directional bias for me, and it's been like this since the end of August. This would need to flip back up to positive again to suggest to me the patient's getting better, and now maybe you look for some opportunities to buy off of the support level, or now maybe you could re-entertain that idea of maybe getting back up to 4,300. But right now, um, the uh, yeah, the market looks tired and it looks vulnerable. You know, when you're when you're thinking about this these market conditions, I mean, I'm I'm immediately thinking about uh, like the Fang stocks or what I would call as the the Manamana stocks. You have these uh, you know six to eight names, these mega cap tech consumer sorts of names. How much of a concern should it be for us that these names are really not participating in any meaningful way? They seem, you know, certainly overall seem to be struggling more than uh, than thriving in this environment. How much of a concern should that be for us? I think it's a big deal. Yeah. What I look at, I actually just five minutes before we went on, I looked at Microsoft and Apple and I looked at the relative performance versus the S&P 500. And what I saw was both of those relative performance lines were sitting on their 63-day moving average, which is one quarter. That means either Microsoft, uh, actually it, was, uh, it wasn't Microsoft, it was Amazon mm. um, and it was Apple. That tells me if you don't start seeing some outperformance between those, um, over with those two stocks, if they don't start outperforming the S&P over the next few days, they are likely to roll over on a relative basis and that's going to be like throwing another couple of bricks on the market, you know, to push it down further. When you're thinking, uh, we only have about a minute left, John, but when you're thinking about, uh, you know, now and, and looking forward here, we obviously have the Fed meeting next week, but, you know, investors are already looking forward to year end when it tends to be seasonally a little stronger part of the year. Are you seeing any opportunities sector wise? I mean, where would you be looking in this sort of environment for opportunity? We have a model that tracks the money flows around the 11 sector spiders. It's called SEAF, it's S-C-A-F. It's an acronym for sector ETF asset flows. The end of October, or I'm sorry, the end of August, and then at the last week of August, in the first week of September, it went overweight financials mm -hmm. and healthcare. And those two have performed well. It just showed me there was money going there and money keeps going there. So, um, I just try to follow the money around the sector board, and those two look like there's some opportunities there, and the market's been responding nicely. Those two have been outperforming now for a few weeks. That's right, two, and the two uh, top sectors uh, in today's uh, market as well. John, listen, it's always a pleasure to have you come through. Thanks for sharing some, uh, some charts with us, some ideas. Stay safe there in Chicago. We'll talk to you again soon. Great to be here. Thanks. That's John Kosar. John's the founder of uh, Asbury Research, coming to us uh, from Chicago. I love his uh, his Asbury Six model is is so um, is so compelling because it combines a tougher a couple different things. It has uh, price, really has breadth, has some sentiment in there. I think you could uh, you could argue, and I like that weight of the evidence approach. Right? It's it's what's your take on the market? Well, five of these six indicators are leaning bearish. So I'm thinking that there's there's some concern about the overall uh, trend in the market. I would turn more positive if. More than three of these turned back to the positive side. And I love that idea of a weight of the evidence, focusing on the evidence the pri that price can uh, communicate, right? The evidence the market can provide uh, back to us. So a lot of wisdom there and how uh, John has uh, structured his approach for sure and uh, willing to share that with us. That's John Kosar from Asbury Research. Let's continue on today's show with our next segment, Getting Sentimental. I mentioned the VIX chart 
Uh, earlier, and what we like to do on uh, usually Wednesday or Thursday is focus in on some of the sentiment indicators. We're going to start with the VIX. And by the way, this sentiment uh, list of charts that I review uh, usually every Thursday is part of a chart pack that you have available to you as a Stock Charts member. And just very briefly, if you have no idea what I'm talking about here, number one, join Stock Charts as a premium member. I guarantee it is well worth uh, the investment of your time and your uh, capital. If you go to your dashboard once you sign in, and uh, click on the chart list. Uh, you will have a list of chart lists. I think you usually have a couple to start with. I have an insane and unwieldy number because I like to create these. But at the very bottom, you will see these little this little gray button called Manage Chart Packs. I have a chart pack that is available free for a Stock Charts member called uh, Dave Keller's Morning Coffee Routine. And this sentiment chart, or all these sentiment charts, are included as one of the many lists that you have access to. So make sure you check that out as a Stock Charts member. Looking at the chart of the VIX, we've talked often about this chart, and it's good to sort of revisit how orderly, to, for lack of a better term, that the sentiment picture in terms of the volatility uh, has fluctuated over the course of 2022. If you did nothing else but look at when the VIX was below 20 and treated those as ideal sell points, and look for when the VIX had spiked above 30 and treat those as essential uh, buy points, you pretty much picked out most of the major turns in 2022. This game is never easy, but it certainly appears to be when you identify uh, that sort of uh, that sort of pattern, how consistently we fluctuated in that range. And this is what I call a volatility regime. You can see that the market often spends about six to nine months or so in a particular in a particular regime, meaning a, a certain range. What's interesting is right now we're uh, pretty far into that. We're almost uh, nine months, I think, into this. A particular, a particular, what I'd call a, a volatility regime of fluctuating within that range. The most recent signal, if you think of it as a uh, as a basic system, is in uh, mid August. We had the market rally, uh, the S and P up to forty three hundred. We saw the VIX pull back to twenty. That ended up being a great indication of upside exhaustion because the market essentially was becoming complacent, right? L relatively low volatility. We can see the volatility picture has certainly rotated. We are not near VIX thirty yet, which means I think one of the general uh, ways you could think about this is maybe that means we're not done with this downtrend. Maybe we have further downside. And if and when we do, I will absolutely be uh, be talking about this chart and be focusing about when we get a VIX spike above 30, because that most likely would be the next tradable low uh, in this market. Next chart is looking at survey data. This is the AAII survey. It's a weekly survey of uh, individual investors. You can see that the bullish reading increased from less than 20% last week to around 26% this week. The bearish reading actually declined from around 50% uh, just over that uh, last week to just uh, under uh, around 46%. The spread between the two is currently around 20%. That's about average for where we've seen uh, so far in uh, 2022. It's about uh, sort of the average uh, spread between bulls and bears. So this week, getting a bit of a, a bounce. Now, obviously, uh, it's interesting that the market gapped lower in a big way on Tuesday. And you wonder if you would ask these questions today, are you bullish or bearish? I wonder how much that survey would change day to day, because I'm sure uh, the uh, the move to the downside certainly shocked a, a lot of uh, individual investors that participate. But at this point, an increase in bullishness, a decrease in bearishness, this point still overall net fairly uh, cautious uh, and uh, similar to previous bear market periods. When we look at the name exposure index, this is looking at what weighting or an average weighting that survey uh, respondents uh, say they have in the equity market. So are you overweight or underweight equities and by what percent? The fact that we're at 34%, if you look at the uh, average over the last six or seven years, an average is around 70% or so, meaning on average, the respondents are 70% weighted in equities versus other asset classes. Currently around 34%, you can see for much of 2022, the respondents in the survey have been very underweight at the equity markets, which makes sense, obviously, given the, the overall bear market phase we've been in. But even with the rally that we've uh, seen in recent days, you're really not seeing much of a spike up to uh, any significant level of overweight uh, equities. It's still a very cautious, still very much a uh, foot firmly on the brake sort of environment uh, based on that name exposure index. And again, the, the highest it's been recently was in mid-August when you rallied to the 200-day moving average, and we got just above 70% uh, in that service. So at this point, it's telling you money managers uh, from, the, uh, from the name exposure index still relatively underweight. 
Finally, we just look briefly at the put call ratios. These are the last two charts that we uh, that we have in here. Put call ratio is obviously looking at the options market, similar to the VIX, but taking a different measure. It's actually looking at put options versus call options and seeing the volume that you see on uh, both sides of those uh, to uh, to get a sense of overall positioning. Now, it is not a hundred percent accurate. You're doing a lot of, uh, and what I mean is, you're doing a lot of inferring what these uh, what these readings actually tell you. But you can see the general inverse relationship. So when the market sells off, you see this ratio accelerating, which basically means options investors are putting way more energy on the put side than the call side, implying they're taking some sort of defensive positioning. You can see when the market uh, starts to rally, the ratio gets very lower because option investors are going down to uh, to the uh, to the call side. And so there tends to be this sort of contrarian inverse relationship between the put call ratios and the uh, the market as a whole. So what's happened most recently? Well, in the last six months or so, we've seen the put call ratio range from around 90.9 uh, uh, on the lower end and around 115 or so on the upper end. And most recently, the lowest level we were at was in mid-August where we uh, peaked out in price and had a relatively low put call ratio. We spiked up uh, higher there. It didn't quite get up to the previous levels of where we've uh, we've seen a market uh, market bottom. From there, we're really mid range of where we've been for the last six months. But it's worth noting that this entire range has gone much higher. As generally speaking, investors have been more defensive than offensive in 2022. Similar to the VIX, I think it's important to just get a sense of where we're at relative to where we've been. Start at where we're at. Look to the left. And you can see right now we're sort of mid range of where we've been. And on the last sell off, we really didn't get to the levels of bearishness that we've been at previous uh, sort of tradable bottoms in 2022. We got to move on and wrap the show and go to the three in three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. We're going to see, keep it simple and look at a chart of the S and P 500 for our first chart. Here, I had a great discussion. Uh, earlier with John Kosar, I like his take on the overall S&P. And again, thinking of the weight of the evidence about looking under the hood and looking at some key ratios, some key trends to see whether or not they agree with the S&P. His overall take was sort of a message of caution. And I get that as 3,900 is being tested today. Cannot underplay the importance of that 3,900 level. Not just me talking about it, but talking with some of my other commentators uh, earlier today. We recorded the pitch talked with Tom Boley, Greg Schnell, and Larry Tentarelli. We as a group talked about that 3,900 level, how important that was, and how you can justify a risk on positioning overall because there's some good charts out there. But how aggressive do you want to be if the S&P is unable to hold this key level of support? Because the problem is if people start going risk off, that starts to affect everything. A rising tide lifts all boats. A falling tide tends to have the opposite impact. Chart number two is a chart of Microsoft. I asked John Kosar, my guest today, about uh, the uh, FANG stocks, or what I call the Menomina stocks. And Microsoft is an important one to highlight. All eight of those names all sort of uh, feeling some pain uh, in uh, in recent months for sure. And a lot of them really rolling over here in the last uh, in the last week or two. The gap higher that you saw last week really being unwound. Tuesday, Wednesday, now Thursday session continuing to push lower, not quite oversold, making a new 12-month relative low today, but I would be looking at the previous level of support. June, uh, the low is around 240.77. We're not quite there, but we're really, really close. And again, my question would be, how bullish do you want to be if a stock like Microsoft, a mega cap name with a pretty decent weight in the XLK and in the S&P 500 as well, how bullish do you want to be if a stock like this is unable to hold a key support level? Is it all bad out there? No. And again, what struck me as we were recording the pitch earlier today, and that's going to air this afternoon on Stock Charts TV, we came up with 15 pretty interesting ideas. And Tesla was one of the names that was pitched by not only uh, one, but more than one of our three commentators all talked about Tesla. You make sure you test, uh, tune into the pitch to uh, to watch that discussion. But I'm struck by how many charts still look pretty constructive, even though there are broad headwinds, even though you have options expiration on Friday, you have the Fed meeting next week, even with all the reasons why the market may go lower, I'm not struggling to find stocks that are working okay. We talked yesterday about restaurants and bars, charts like Starbucks. We talked about... Um, the uh, um, uh, renewable energy names like Enphase, some of the solar stocks. And we've talked about Tesla and Rivian and other charts that are starting to work. It's always a good time to own good charts. So make sure a part of your daily 
and weekly routine is to identify charts that are working. Tesla, particularly if it can get above previous resistance from August, could be a really interesting setup for further upside. Folks, that is our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close. Special thank you to John Kosar from Asbury Research joining us from Chicago. All of our previous discussions are available at StockChartsTV.com. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe and have a great night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.